This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so, seeing a, a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order the meeting of the regional Amherst Cone Regional School Committee at uh, 6.31 p.m. on November 4th. Um, we'll take a roll call attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan present. And um, McDonald present. Um, thanks everyone and welcome um, Emily Gribko, um, our student representative. And, and um, we also have uh, Doug Slaughter, Mike Morris and Obed. I apologize, I'm not able to pronounce your last name um, joining us this evening. Um, I'm now also going to call to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.32 p.m. and I will take roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, our first item is to approve our minutes from September 22nd and those were included in our packet. Does anybody have any comments? Uh, uh, Dr. Morris. Just on the bottom of the first page where it says Rebecca, um, it's Klaus, K-L-A-U-S. So just a K instead of a C. Mr. Demling. Um, on item number 10, the adjournment, um, it was just a regular meeting. So just strike uh, the executive session. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, uh, section three, part B, memorandum of agreements. Um, let's see, move that we approve the memorandum of agreement for UF, UFCW, not for Amherst School Committee. It has, it has, it has AFSCME in there too, so. Yeah. yeah, and we did not vote on that one. Right. Yeah. Um, I also had on the uh, item 3C, virtual private school application. I feel like that was included in another one, but the second line, the school committee, it says has a liability for what's private. It should say has no liability. Um, and then further in that same section, um, I think it's the third to the last line. Dr. Morris said private schools benefit our community through financial benefits. Um, and the impact is less than charter schools. Is that correct, Dr. Morris? Yeah, I was gonna comment on that one as well. Thank you for prompting me. So I think, uh, so I'd have to go back and watch and I did not, I meant to do that today and I apologize. Um, I, think, I think what was intended is Dr. Morris said that private schools impact our community financially, but the impact is less than charter schools. Because the impact is really just on the chapter 70 piece. It's not, it doesn't have the same per pupil cost. Um, so I think that's what I was intending to say there. Um, does that ring a bell to people? I know it was a little while ago, but yeah. okay. Any other edits? I'm seeing none. Oh, uh, Ms. Kenny. It, my, it, I guess it's more of a question. I didn't have a chance to look it up. Is CPAC, S-E-P-A-C? And yeah. so on the, the second paragraph under number five, it's both uh, their name and then also I think their email address would be different too. Correct. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't look it up. And then I also uh, noticed uh, it's also page five. So I am going to apologize, Obed, because I 
also don't want to butcher your last name, but he is the only person referred to by his first name, as opposed to everybody else who's referred to as a last name person. Any further com edits? Um, seeing none. Um, yes, we can do that. Um, so I'll move to approve the minutes at, at, as uh, updated for the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, likewise, I'll move uh, to approve the minutes as added, as updated for the regional school committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. And roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So uh, those two motions both pass uh, unanimously. Amherst, four to zero, and um, region, um, seven to zero. Next up, we have public comment. Um, and this evening we have one um, public comment um, that's a voice. We also have it um, in, in writing. And I just got word that it, the letter is posted on our school committee agendas webpage um, under public comment there. I'm just turning the volume up. Okay. This is Alicia Reed. Today I'm speaking on behalf of 105 Amherst Pelham Regional School District families who signed the following letter to the Amherst Pelham Education Association. That's a total of 169 parents and caregivers, 30% more families than signed the previous letter encouraging the school committee and teachers union to renegotiate. This signals clear, growing, and powerful momentum. We wanted to make sure the school committee heard what we have to say too. Here was what, here is what we wrote. Dear APA leadership, as the parents and caregivers of children in the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, today we are writing to voice our strong support of the request to the Amherst Pelham Education Association from the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee to reopen negotiation regarding the decision metrics for in-person schooling. We believe that as a scientific understanding of COVID-19 evolves, both the APA and the school committee need to be poised to move quickly and collaboratively in response to this changing understanding, not just today, but well into 2021. The APA must be a part of this conversation. The community is crying out for your participation. Please hear our call. Thank you. Um, so included in that document um, is the the names of all the families, um, the individuals that have signed on to that public comment. And as mentioned, it's available on the school committee agendas webpage. And now we'll move on to our next item, um, number five. Um, welcome, Ms. Lord. Um, we are now on the superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. So I've got um, four items um, for the update tonight. Um, one, I want to acknowledge uh, before I do those four items that, you know, it's slightly odd. Um, I know that attention perhaps isn't on local issues at the moment. So I want to um, really acknowledge and thank our educators for um, stepping up and being able to support our students in a significant variety of ways as the students have undergone a range of emotions this week and continue to do so as, as all of us do, I think, in the country. Um, and I think dealing with the uncertainty of the current situation, while we're seeing some trends uh, this afternoon and evening, uh, there's still trends. Um, they're not at um, resolution. So 
Uh, you know, I want to thank our principals too. We've met multiple times this week uh, about how to support folks and they've offered optional sessions for staff members before school, during lunches, after school today. Um, they've been popping in classes, making sure that mental health folks are available um, throughout the day for students, for staff. Um, you know, this is a this is a nonpartisan statement that this is a very stressful time for many people uh, in our community, and we want to make sure that we're supporting our staff so that they can support our kids. And so far, I really want to thank everyone that was um, really thoughtful lesson plan developed at the high school that was given as a sample, so that our high school um, staff would be able to be able to um, talk about um, the election and and how it's impacting um, all the students as well as the faculty and staff. So. Um, you know, I think it, it's 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 a wild ride in the season of wild rides, and uh, you know, I just I'd be remiss if I started my update and didn't thank folks for for being able to do that, um, and that that really goes for all staff. Um, you know, it's we we met after school today, uh, we being the leadership team, and one of the things I continued to hear was uh, from principals who stopped in classes, heard what the, what was the dialogue that was happening. Um, talk to mental health folks, how they could continue that work tomorrow. It's not a one day process and it might be a dragged out for a long time process. And so we want to make sure that um, that students still have access to be able to share their opinions to get the support they need academically, socially, and, and make sure we're per 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 preserving everybody's well-being. Uh, which leads me to my first, actually had five points. I lied. I should have said five instead of four. So next Thursday, um, so a week from tomorrow, we're doing a coffee hour with two folks, two um, social workers, therapists from the Bright program. And it's particularly focused on as we head into, as it's pitch black out right now and has been for a while, as we're heading into winter, as we're heading into less sunlight and more indoor time uh, for many people based on the weather, we wanna make sure that we're starting a series where parents and caregivers have the opportunity to talk about the stresses um, that that causes I'm someone who really misses the sun this time of year and the warm weather, although I think the next week we're going to have some unusually warm weather. Um, the sun's still going down really early and, and folks are able to be outside less. And we know that info it impacts students' social emotional well-being. So, um, you know, we're going to be working with those experts uh, to provide that resource. So it's 530 next week. It was emailed out. It was in the newsletter and was emailed out and we'll, we'll send a reminder next week. Uh, second thing I want to share is that um, we had an excellent curriculum day yesterday. We started the, the day with Bettina, Dr. Bettina Love, who's a professor at the University of Georgia, um, who speaks a lot about um, racism, um, anti-Blackness, um, leading with Black love, um, and just I, I'm not going to try to encapsulate her talk in this time because I will fail miserably, uh, but I will say it was powerful heartening. It brought out a tremendous amount of emotions and thoughts from our faculty and staff, and it was just incredibly moving and really focused us on action. We followed that up with, um, I think it was up to 15-ish sessions that were led uh, primarily by our faculty and staff in the district. Uh, there were some outside folks who also helped, uh, all in the focus of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, very powerful morning. Um, it wasn't lost on us that it was also the election morning, and you know, in my introductory comments, I noted that because the juxtaposition of um, the intensity of, of the work plus the intensity of the moment uh, wasn't lost on anyone. Second thing or third thing I guess I want to talk about is uh, one of the last times we met, we talked about a drop in enrollment. Um, I think it'll go out tomorrow that we are surveying all families who were members of our district last year uh, in terms of having children and are no longer having students uh, or a student enrolled in our district, we're trying to ascertain, you know, make sure we know where they are, why they left, are they planning to come back, offering for a direct phone call from me or another district director or principal, if they wanna, if it's more comfortable for folks to follow up um, that way. And so we'll be able to share that data back with you sometime probably next month, but it is trying to understand, uh, I, you know, I think we had a good dialogue about why that might be the case and as some anecdotal evidence, and we're trying to have some uh, more than just the kind of individual anecdotal pieces, but uh, a more systematized approach to understanding uh, the choices folks made and, and whether they're permanent choices or temporary choices. The fourth thing is um, good news, which is um, very challenging on Mr. Dr. Slaughter's office, but we got yet another grant. Um, and this one was on, the, it's the state teacher diversification grant that we got last year. We got it again. 
It's about a hundred ten thousand dollar grant, which is fabulous. And and much like last year, our focus is uh, for para educators uh, of color who are interested in becoming teachers to provide tuition support, MTEL support, and then also to provide professional development for the district. So thanks to Shannon, uh, who works in, in Doug's office, who, who does a lot of the technical work, um, Doreen Cunningham and some others who worked on that. And so just wonderful news for our district, continuing um, the, the work that we have been doing and allowing us to kind of continue that and perhaps even expand that work, which has been successful to date. The last thing I have is, um, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions today uh, for whatever reason about what our metrics are, because theoretically we could be back on Monday. Um, and I've responded to those saying that, you know, with the metrics we have and the current case count that we see in the three counties noted, um, just very bluntly, we aren't close to being able to come back. And that's not a political statement. That's not uh, I want to be really clear and transparent, you know, and to be transparent, it's not trying to prove a point. It's just that's a question I've been getting asked uh, by mostly by staff, although many staff are saying I'm hearing this from families as well. Um, you know, and, you know, just the way our metrics are low or where our metrics sit and the current case count that we're seeing and the trends that we're seeing in Western Massachusetts, as well as beyond, uh, we are starting actively to plan for an extended closure. Um, and how long that is, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I've actually found myself not obsessing every four o'clock about what the case count is in Massachusetts because we're so far removed from uh, the 28 per 100,000 metric that we have um, that, that it, 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 it's not seemed, um, I do check it, but it seems like I'm, I'm obsessing less because we're, unless somehow it's eradicated in the next two days, I think we'd still have enough in the first couple of days of this week where we'd be over that metric, particularly Hamden County. Well, it's only 10% of the the kind of how it's calculated. It's, you know, they're really struggling with COVID in, in, Ham, in Hamden County. It's certainly over the metric in Hampshire and Franklin County as well, or at least it was in the last couple of days. I want to thank Debbie Westmoreland and Jerry Champagne. We do have trying to update it every day, um, but, you know, I think it was last updated yesterday, but we're trying to, on our website is, um, a calculator we modeled off the Cambridge one so that people can look. But the short story is we're not close to the 28. Um, and so when I say we're planning for extended closure, that's kind of three domains. One is we're planning for it academically. You'll hear uh, Obed primarily, I'll do a little bit, but um, Obed will mostly present the information about the distance learning survey and what we've learned and, and what we can uh, gather to improve the experience for everybody. Uh, the second part is financial, um, that there are financial ramifications uh, both in the current year's budget, you'll hear that from Dr. Slaughter a little bit later, um, as well as looking ahead to FY22, which um, Amherst will release its financial indicators and projections on Monday of next week. So we'll know a little more next week. We'll be able to talk in a little more depth about next year. And lastly, operationally, uh, that if we are closed for an extended period of time, that that changes some of the, the just the functions of folks in the operational world. Um, that's not a, uh, I'm not trying to make anyone anxious or nervous, but it's just if you, if you look at the numbers we have, we're not close to that metric. We haven't been close since we closed. Um, I don't I don't think we're trending in a way that we'll um, have our number now or anything like that. So, you know, our administrative team is certainly shifting. We're ready to go back in person. Uh, I'll be honest that, you know, we loved having kids in schools. Um, that was welcomed uh, by, by all of our educational leaders. Um, and if that's not in the cards, we have to do the best with what we've got. And so we're actively planning again on those three domain, domains, uh, academic, financial, and operational. Um, and then we can always toggle back if things get better. Um, but at the current time, that's not the way uh, we're seeing it. And we want to make sure that we're doing the best uh, by resource management in terms of academics and reaching all students uh, and also making sure that we're, we're covering our operational uh, elements as well. So it's really, it's not easy work um, to be toggling back and forth, but you know, honestly, I prefer the toggling back and forth planning than the long-term closure planning, but it, that's where the numbers are right now. Um, and so, you know, I just thought I'd, I'd share that with the committee because I think it's important for you all to know the work that the administrative team is doing and, and how it's shifted over the last, particularly uh, over the last four or five days. Um, we've, we've had multiple conversations about this shift. And that's my update for the night. Sorry, it sort of toggled between more fun, good news, and exciting professional development for staff, uh, and then some harder news there at the end. But um, just felt like transparently, I needed to keep the committee and the community informed of uh, what we're planning for, and you know what we're managing, and what we may come back in two weeks with more information about. Any questions or comments for 
Dr. Morris, Mr. Denley. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate you bringing up the potential financial impact of an extended closure. Um, you know, it's uh, especially with regards to its impact to next year, it's yeah. going to be a concern of mine. So um, obviously what we spend in FY21 for resources affects FY22. And I think, although obviously everything's, you know, volatile as, as of this hour, um, my, my, in my personal opinion, the prospects for a wonderful, amazing, and near-term bailout from the federal government to state government, uh, the prospects for that have been significantly diminished with all the unfortunate downstream effects for um, projected state support of public education. So I think that I think that just makes the problem all the more acute in terms of wanting to do all we can to, um, you know, manage the FY20 budget as, as carefully as we can so that we are in the best possible position for FY22. So that's, that's just a comment. And I appreciate you bringing that up and hope we can maintain a, a good focus on that in the, in the coming months. Um, a qu question is, um, so last kind of follow up from last uh, meeting. So last meeting, you gave us a, an overview of um, how in-person learning went. Um, and uh, since then, there's, there's been some recent public discussion about um, some aspects of that, um, specifically uh, PPE availability for staff, um, student adherence with masks and distancing, and um, what our classroom disinfecting practices are. Um, and uh, I just, I remember from your, you, the, the update that you gave us last time, you covered all these, these items. Uh, I talked about the, the PPE preparation that we've been um, uh, purchasing for, for months and how well our kids, our, our youngest, highest need kids did with, um, with, with cooperation and enthusiasm with, with masks and, and distancing. And, and, and I was also struck in my memory for the, but the truly commendable performance of our, our dedicated custodial staff. So um, I just like given the recent public discussions, if you could just refresh our memory on, on how that, I know it was a brief in-person period, but uh, just, just how it went on those fronts. Sure, I'd like to maybe comment on the financials very briefly, um, and we'll get to that when Dr. Slaughter presents, but I think just the one thing to note in both districts that are represented in tonight's meeting, um, both districts opted uh, at the recommendation of, of staff, uh, myself included, to use a pretty significant amount of school choice reserves that's not sustainable to continue to use. And I think that's gonna be a conversation we have to come back to in the next couple of weeks um, once we get a sense of the FY22 budget, because, you know, um, we say this every year or every district says it, but literally this year, every dollar we spend is is gonna lead to a, a challenge next year because we're, 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 we really relied on soft money and uh, at some point that runs out. So um, just wanted to comment and remind the committees that that there was six digits of soft money in both the Amherst and the regional budget um, for the current year. Um, so the three things you mentioned for PPE, PPE was identified, it was located in each school and some places, some schools was located in two places, um, like the PPE that would have been more for specialized program staff was located closer to those specialized programs and where the general was. If anyone was short on PPE, they were to notify administrator, administrator would have that. There was no limit on masks or, you know, that kind of thing. We double the order of gowns that, that people wanted or scrubs. Um, so, um, to my, there's not been a report. I did check in with principals about um, staff um, not finding masks or um, other essential items, you know, um, and I want to thank Rupert and the whole facilities department because the distribution process sounds really simple when from the outside. And then I asked some questions and got a clear understanding of how complex it was, uh, particularly for some of the isolation gowns and scrubs that were sized as opposed to masks, which are one size fits all uh, in terms of the KN95. So, um, that was our process for that. Um, I think, you know, there were, in terms of masks, uh, what I saw in every school is students um, doing quite well with that. Uh, there were individual students who we did work with families in a problem-solving approach, as we spoke about here many, many times, um, to try to work on uh, challenges that students were facing. And for the most part, those problem-solving processes worked well. Um, there might have been individual situations where we had to have more active intervention um, to try to help students, but I think for, for students who are three and four and five years old, masks are like n no different than lots of other things that we're trying to work with students on is, is it's, a teaching, it's a teaching process and we want to build the tolerance of students over time. And that's true for kind of other preschools in our area that require masks that we've spoken to is that there, there is an adjustment period um, for, for students to be able to do that. And just, I think the parents, have, our experience has been the parents and caregivers have been highly supportive of us enforcing that and working with us in a problem solving manner. 
And the last one, uh, just want to go over, um, you know, uh, again, an appreciation for our custodial staff um, who, you know, worked tirelessly to get the spaces ready. Um, so if there is an accident, for instance, in the room, like a student accident, remember we're talking about young kids, um, the custodian is intended to, is, is directed to go in the room and the students are to leave the room while that that's being cleaned up and that's around COVID safety and just thank the custodial staff for doing that. They, you know, the last thing our custodians want to do is disrupt teaching and learning. Um, that is not high on their priority list. In fact, they feel really bad because they really see themselves as their work, which I see is supporting the teaching and learning. Um, so I know that that's an uncomfortable moment to ask people to leave, but you know, there were situations where that um, had to occur. And, you know, just again, thank, thank everybody in the facilities department and the training that went on for custodians um, because it's not easy work. Um, and particularly when you're dealing with bodily fluids, it's, you know, particularly challenging work and making sure we keep everyone safe is the highest priority. And it does sometimes mean that um, there's interruptions to teaching and learning, um, but um, that's what folks are tasked to do. And, you know, if there was any issues, it would you know, go to the principal again, go to facilities to manage it. And that's our, our um, that's the process that it has if there's concerns that it goes to the principal and the principal, our principals did a great job managing that where whether it was calling Jill Consolino or Rupert uh, or whoever was needed to, to manage any issue. Um, so that's kind of the summary to in response to your question. Any other um, questions from the committee? I do, I do have two quick questions, I think. Um, so sort of building on the questions that Mr. Demling just asked, um, it's my understanding that the JLMSC would be also another avenue for discussing those those topics. And um, so I guess it's a, is the JLMC meeting this week? Um, and if so, when? Or when is the next meeting? So I can think I can answer that, but Mr. Sullivan or Mr. Harrington can certainly jump in if you like. So my understanding was um, that um, uh, Sasha Virgo, who often acts as the secretary to the school committee, emailed JLMC and asked for topics on Monday afternoon. She asked that she needed them by last night so it, the meeting could be posted because there are two school committees, a subcommittee of the school committee. Um, there were no agenda items sent. She sent a reminder this morning or midday today. There were no items sent. Um, since it's a posted meeting, it can't meet on Friday without a posted agenda because that would be breaking open meeting law. So um, I imagine tomorrow she'll follow up with the committee to try to reschedule for early next week if there are agenda items um, to be had. But um, the members of that committee are some from the Amherst Health Department, uh, Mr. Harrington, Mr. Sullivan, and then three members of the APEA uh, who are emailed on this loop today. Is that an accurate summary for Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Harrington perspective? Am I missing anything? Okay. And, th and then my other question was on um, just on the curriculum day, you shared with us the, the schedule for the day and it was an impressive um, list of opportunities um, happening. And I'm just I was like, just out of curiosity, just how are those, how is that schedule put together and how are those um, sessions sort of selected and developed? Sure. So um, the, the organizers, the primary organizer, Tim Sheen and Doreen Cunningham, um, and they're supported by other staff, Jadira Torres, Carol Newman Rose, and Debbie Westmoreland. And so um, what they've done, and they did it again this year, is after the curriculum day, they asked for feedback. We see what worked well, uh, what didn't work well. We usually get multiple hundred responses from um, staff members. And um, sometime in the spring, sometime in the summer, they put out a request, essentially like a request for proposals. We really feel like when we shifted from having more exclusively outside uh, uh, external speakers uh, for long periods of time with large audiences, and we've shifted to having a keynote and then smaller group with our own staff, that the feedbacks improved significantly. So uh, that's how it works. We send an email out um, to the entire district. We ask for people who want to propose. They're supported throughout that process. Um, and, you know, in an odd sort of way, I got to pop in more rooms than I typically would, even though it's at the high school usually, and I can pop around. The, the, there are some occasional advantages to uh, the virtual environment for people in my role that way. Um, and what I saw was highly engaging and highly engaged dialogue from the participants. So uh, really it comes from the survey data, what people are saying, this worked well, what's missing, um, and then asking our staff, are they willing to present and what topics they like to present on? And uh, Doreen and Tim uh, facilitate and organize that work um, to happen. That's great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If anyone gets to see Dr. Love too, she is, as I said, just 
phenomenal and moving. And uh, yeah, she's um, she she was. I felt very you know the structure of it, which is maybe worth mentioning, is the first half hour, thirty five minutes or so, were um, her. She you know she went through and and presented, and the last were for question and answer. So I was like the kind of moderator, so to speak. And you know uh, you know I'm doing this a while. Um, I don't often get nervous, but I was a little in awe and probably wasn't my best self because um, she, she's just uh, quite a powerful speaker. Um, I'm sure Doug and uh, others who are on the call can attest to that. So um, really, really, you know, the feedback on that was incredible from our faculty and staff. That's great. Thank you. If there's no other comments or questions from the committee, then we can move on. Okay. Um, Chair's update. I don't have um, an update um, for tonight. So we'll move on to school committee announcements. Um, uh, does anybody from the committee have any announcements? Ms. Lord. I have two announcements. The first is to welcome anyone to our SCTO School Equity Task Force meeting that meets on the third Wednesdays of every month. That would be November 18th at six o'clock. The second is to thank all of our parent volunteers. Um, I haven't said it before, but they really make our school so much greater, better, more enriched. And I saw a parent volunteer handing out lunches today and I know she's been doing it since March. So thank you to the parent volunteers that um, are working behind the scenes to make it all happen. Thank you. Any other announcements? Ms. Spitzer. I just wanted to share that um, with the committee that we had a successful um, Amherst Education Foundation trivia night. Um, ben and Hala, or Mr. Harrington and Ms. Lord uh, joined me and I think we did well. We didn't come in, we didn't place, but I think we had a strong showing. So I wanna thank AEF for all they do for the schools and, and every, all the folks in the community who came together to show their support. It's great. I watched it on, on TV. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Morris. Sorry, something I missed, uh, but it's relevant to the committee's conversation. Uh, I think the last time I've been in touch, uh, she's been in touch with me. I want to compliment uh, Representative um, Dom, uh, who was in touch with me about the enrollment issue. Enrollment dropped in Chapter 70 potential uh, challenges. Um, she did meet with, she shared with me that she did meet with the Chair of the Education, the House Committee on Education, uh, Representative Paish, um, and shared back that it was a productive conversation, that um, this is being shared by multiple representatives across the state, and um, that um, the Education Committee is dedicated to working on some level of resolution on how this will work for FY22. Again, it's too early to say what that looks like, but it, they definitely uh, are hearing this from lots of people, lots of committees, um, lots of superintendents. Um, and she is advocating on the behalf of Amherst Pelham and one precinct in Granby, I believe, uh, on this topic. Um, and, you know, has continued to be in close contact with me. So uh, thanks to you all for raising the topic and, and getting that going. And I just wanted to share that update. Sorry, I forgot about it on my turn a couple minutes ago. Ms. Spitzer. And with the mention of advocacy, you reminded me that one of our members has recently been recognized for his work. So I want to just commend um, and congratulate uh, Peter Dumling on his award, or is that the right word? Yeah, it's the, he won the MASCs, which is the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, Division 5 All-State School Committee 2020 award. So it's, it's a little bit disappointing, I think, that you're not going to be able to go and celebrate in person. But I, I do want to, you know, thank you for all the work you do advocating for not only the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School Committee, but but for our state. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> and I think uh, we uh, will be circling back on that same topic later in this agenda tonight. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Mr. Dunling. That's great. Okay, so um, we'll move on to our new and continuing business and we'll start with um, the distance learning survey results. And I'll turn that over to Dr. Morris. 
Yep. And Obed's going to work with me on this. Um, Obed, do you want me to display my screen? Because I have two screens up, so it might be easier so you can stay. Okay. That works. So um, let me present it. Um, I want to share that Obed did a significant part of the uh, analysis of this. And so I want to thank him. This is likely the last time uh, he'll be uh, at a school committee meeting, um, at least this school committee at this time. Um, thrilled that Obed is continuing, looking to continue his career and move into education as he graduates this spring from Amherst College. Nice Amherst College hue to this presentation as well that Obed uh, put together. Um, but really, uh, Obed's been with us since the summer, as you know, and has been a full part of our administrative team. He's worked with Doreen on um, some of the work on anti-racism and understanding where people are with that and mental health and wellness and, and certainly in uh, analyzing the experience of, of students, families, and staff in distance learning. So I um, was in a conversation with some folks at Amherst College today about, you know, potential future internships. And I just said, if you have more people like Obed, please send them our way. We will we will find things for them to do. Um, and you have a bright career ahead of you, Obed, in, in education. So I'm just thrilled that you're staying in the field. Wish you were staying more local, but, you know, that's the way it goes. And I uh, wish you the best moving forward. So I wanted to say that at the outset. Um, Absolutely. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll just going to do the first couple slides and I'll share a general overview and some of the demographic information. And Obed's going to do more of the content. Um, there's about 18 or 19 slides, I think, of content. Um, so uh, I think we can pause after every slide or every other to see if there are questions. I don't, it skips around different topics. So I, I do want to, I don't want to wait till the end because you may feel like your question um, isn't as relevant at the end as it is during the time. So this was the survey we got, uh, again, a bit over 250 responses that was uh, was given to all students in grades 7 through 12, uh, families over 1,000, and staff 328 responses. So pretty decent sample size um, for our, uh, our families, uh, students, and staff. It, it is worth noting that uh, there were some differences in demographics of um, who, who responded. So you could see that 7th and 12th grade were really underrepresented in the data. We can't quite figure out why that is. Um, seventh grade is a, maybe a little more understandable. Tenth grade uh, seems harder to make sense of, uh, but we thought it was worth noting. All the other grade levels were roughly equivalent to where they were proportionally. Um, for families and staff, uh, the grade levels, the schools were again, all roughly proportional um, to um, the number of, of, of students and staff and families in those schools. Um, we did note that white students were overrepresented um, in the survey results and Latinx students were underrepresented. Uh, all the other racial ethnic groups were again roughly proportional. Uh, you know, that is a curious point and we did, we are digging into why. And uh, another topic, the last bulleted point is something we'd like to come back to probably a week or two from now, because this is a, a something we're very concerned administrative team. We met for a long time uh, on this data point actually this afternoon. Um, that we are starting to look at the absentee rate for virtual. Uh, when we were in person, as an aside, you know, the attendance was, was quite strong. It was only seven days, so it's hard to judge. Um, but one of the things that we, we're noting is there's a significant gap between, um, or disparity between Latinx students um, in terms of their per share of enrollment and a much higher disproportionate rate of student absences. And so we wondered or posited that that might have something to do with the underrepresentation uh, in the survey results. Uh, all the other racial ethnic groups were roughly equivalent or in the ballpark. Um, so this is a deeply, I'll just be blunt, it's a deeply disturbing piece of data that we're noticing. Uh, we're going to continue to meet multiple times a week on this. Um, you know, you'll see later in the survey, um, it's not our belief that this is about devices and internet at this point. There's always, you know, things we can improve with that. Um, so uh, this two things to share. One is we feel like this is our responsibility as a district. I want to be super duper clear that this is not at all suggesting anything about families or students' willingness to engage in distance learning. This is about what we need to do to better engage um, a certain population of families and students in distance learning. And the second thing is we have to come back with solutions. This is not a situation we are willing to tolerate, um, that we have this overrepresentation and absences. Um, we're also trying to look at the Get some, gather some data on absences and engagement. So it's one thing to be on a Google Meet. It's another thing to be engaged in a Google Meet. And so uh, we've, we're having this data, which just came to us um, last night. And so we've already met about it for about an hour today. We're going to be meeting again on Friday. We're meeting on Monday. This is not something that 
uh, we're pleased with. We are noticing this trend in other places. If you look in California, a lot of districts are noticing the same trend that if you look at um, race ethnicity as well as socioeconomic status or subsidized lunch status, that there is a trend in, in who's um, attending virtual classes. And it's still, we're not doing well enough as a district, if that's our data that we're seeing. And so um, I wanna make sure we get into the, the content of the survey and don't leave that out. But for us, we felt it'd be remiss not to highlight that this data is not displaying the feedback from all of our community, or it's not proportionally sharing all of our community's feedback. And we plan to do an awful lot with the data that we received on the, our attendance piece. Um, and, and more soon on that. So I don't want to invalidate what's what, what, what's going to come, but I also want to say that there's a real gap here um, that we need to dig in on. So I think the next slide is going to, oh, I'll do the next slide about themes, but are there any questions about kind of who responded and how they responded um, before I go on to themes and more of the content? Ms. Spitzer? This isn't so much about who responded, but just trying to learn a little bit more about what you're saying about the trends you're seeing in absentee rates and the disparities there. Because um, that seems really concerning. I'm wondering, have you seen higher absentee rates overall compared kind of year over year ch changes? And is, the, is this a decline that is unique to this year? Um, or is the disparity that we're seeing unique to this year as well? Or is it something that's been, and it's just been exacerbated by the pandemic? So it's the latter. So uh, there there has been minor, minor disparities in terms of attendance rate um, by some of these other demographic variables. Nothing on the magnitude of what we're talking about in terms of distance learning. Last spring, it was really hard to judge that now that we're collecting more accurate data. Um, we are seeing um, trends that are um, unacceptable. Um, and we need to do better as an organization. And that might be, you know, we're still at the nascent stages of having the discussion, but even the brainstorming that we're trying not to do, we're trying to do the thing where you dig into the data and don't come up with solutions so you understand it. And uh, like most conversations where there's a lot of uh, emotions and concern, we failed at trying to keep those boundaries clean. Uh, but we are gonna have to think about resource allocation and, and what we're doing to ensure that um, in a virtual environment that all of our students have access to learning. And again, I think the fo focus so much last spring and, and it still continues is the technology piece and, you know, anecdotally what we're hearing, because, um, you know, we do have groups that have been noticing these trends at the school counselors and other folks who have been talking to principals. Um, it's not so much the, do I have a Chromebook and do I have Wi-Fi? There are other factors that seem to be influencing students' access to the curriculum. They'll get, to, we'll talk about them in a couple minutes. Um, probably less explicitly as tied to demographics as we are exactly at this moment, but this is a market change from our typical enrollment and attendance patterns. Sorry, that was a really long, I should have just said that last thing. I gave more context, but it, this is um, this this was um, really, really concerning information that we, uh, we have. And the, the data was from uh, September 15th till yesterday. So it was, you know, we, I asked for it Monday. Our, talented IS folks uh, were able to drill down by school, by demographic group, by special education status, by subsidized lunch, and using something, Doug will correct me, I think a pivot table. I think if that's what it's called, you're able to, to really disaggregate in some pretty neat ways. Um, so, um, you know, this is something, you know, we were looking, you know, we do have some standardized measures that are coming in in terms of achievement. Um, but what we know is one of the highest correlations to academic achievement, probably the highest, I believe, is student attendance and the second one is staff attendance, right? Everything else comes after those two. In other words, if the kid's not there, the teacher's not there, uh, we know kids aren't learning. And in this case, I'm not so worried about the staff attendance, that looks pretty consistent, you know, compared to a typical year, if not a little better in terms of the virtual, but the student attendance and the disparity between it is, is a high point of concern for us. So again, more soon on that, but if there's any other questions before I go on, I'm open to hear. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is, you know, we are going to put these uh, surveys out publicly, but uh, I think all in all, they comprise something like 500 pages that all have to be scrubbed for personally identifying information. So it's going to take a little bit of a while uh, for us to scrub them. So, you know, we're going to do some overview piece, but uh, please note that we do intend for these to be public documents. Probably by the end of next week, we'll have them all scrubbed 
Um, just if people mentioned individual staff members or their name, kids' names, uh, we want to scrub those for, in terms of anonymity uh, and confidentiality. But otherwise, we intend to, we will be putting these out publicly. So three big themes that came out of all that couple hundred pages of, of uh, analysis. One is that online learning this year is being experienced much, much um, improved from last spring. Uh, and that's, you'll see in a second, but that's being reported by all stakeholder groups, by students, by staff members, and by caregivers. That being said, we get to theme number two, which is that there were significant concerns expressed about student engagement, uh, student well-being, and connections to peers and to staff members. There was a lot of concerns about mental health and social emotional well-being. Um, and, and again, that was pretty consistent across stakeholder groups uh, that those concerns were expressed. The last one is, is the more complex theme. Uh, it's, I don't know if theme's even the right word, but uh, you know, this concept of screen time, which is certainly, you can't help but you Google you know, distance learning and there's gonna be articles about screen time. Uh, there were you know, equal amounts concerns about how much direct instruction was occurring uh, as there was concerns about how much time is being spent on computers. And so it's hard to rectify those. My, only thought on it is it's it's sort of an unfortunate situation that we wouldn't design school typically to be done on computer. And so lots of people, there's a lot of mixed feelings and uh, about the need to have that direct instruction that it can't just be tasked students do without uh, adult support. Uh, but to do that, um, there are screens involved. And so, you know, the I'm not sure what to do with that theme except to note it and to suggest that there's a dynamic tension there that is hard to resolve and that's not an Amherst thing, that's an, an every district thing that's involved in distance learning at the moment. We'll get in much more details. I'm gonna turn it over to Obed to take on um, the more detailed analysis that'll come in the next couple of slides. But um, those were the three major themes that we found looking through all the da data sets from all the stakeholder groups. Questions about themes before we transition to more hard data? Turn it over to you, Abed. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say thank you first and foremost to Dr. Morris for the introduction um, and helping me with this as well. Um, I just want to echo many of the things that he said, but in particular, the, asp the theme of how remote learning is being experienced as an improvement from last year. And my hope is that by looking at the more nuance in the data, we'll be able to contextualize those more general themes. And so with this survey, we were able to see some data about student device usage and access. So first and foremost, we found that on average, students are spending about roughly four and a half hours on daily um, live video calls. And when you combine that with homework, that comes out to about six hours. And students are um, have reported that they have access to devices that they need for remote learning activities, as well as internet to be able to do their work. And these were similar results that were collected among staff and families. And so um, further um, in, this, in these surveys, we asked staff, excuse me, we asked students and families about whether the time that is spent on remote learning is that manageable. And so as you can see in both responses, over half of the, of the respondents indicated that the time was manageable, um, but it's still worth noting that there are still um, some concern about the manageability of the time. In particular, I'm looking at the blue marker, the barely manageable sign. So we see that in the student responses, about 22% of students that completed the survey indicated that the time was barely manageable. And then for the family responses, about 17%. So it's, it's good to note that the time is manageable for um, many students, but that may not be the case for all. Question? Mr. Downing? Yeah. yeah. So, like one in four students or a little less than one in four family members barely are not manageable. I was just wondering with um, if, if in the comments, um, if you if you noticed any examples of themes, and I know you haven't read all thousand comments yet, but um, but in in those in those so like that that can block of concern, I would call it of, of of people really not feeling like it's working. What what kind of things were mentioned? So I would say one of the things um, that comes up a lot, and it's not necessarily specific to this question, um, is the concept of the screen time. 
Um, and that's been um, a major concern for students in that there's a lot of time spent on screens. And so that doesn't leave enough time to do homework because you have like the meetings and things like that. So I would say that that would be probably one of the more prevalent themes. And Obed, if I could add, I think just uh, the other the other half of what you said is the homework seems like, you know, again, the student responses only came from secondary students. And that seems like a particular stressor uh, when students are spending that much time on screen. So I think the, the confluence of the combination of the direct instruction happening on screens and most of the work happening through Google Classroom or things like that. Um, I think I think I definitely read the same thing that Obed uh, talked about. Um, I think the other piece um, that is probably worth noting is um, we'll get to it later. Is that when we start disaggregating a bit, um, we see some differences in some of these responses. We didn't disaggregate this particular one, but I think if you if you hold a couple slides, you'll see when we do disaggregate by things like students with disabilities um, and the age of students, uh, we see some real differences in the data. And um, we, you know, we could have done 60 slides and disaggregated every one, but, but I think it'll become more clear in the next couple slides uh, what I'm referencing. Okay, so this, this is when we uh, started to look at how independently students can complete their work. And as you see here, this is based off of the responses from students in the 7th to 12th grades. So as you can see here, most students are able to complete their work, um, whether that's each assignment independently or most assignments. And so what we decided to do was to disaggregate this uh, exact question by school level, so elementary, middle, and high school. And we also compared those responses to the same to the responses to the same question from last spring. So as you can see here, um, in the transition from spring, which is on the left, to this year, which is on the right, more students in the on the elementary level are being able to complete their work. But it's still worth noting that there is still a good amount of students that need assistance. And so, in particular, I'm looking at the the purple, the blue, and the red. And when we get to the middle and high school, um, we see a similar trend, but it's just a little slightly different that while more students are completing their work independently, the amount of students that need help is reducing. And we see that similar trend among the high school as well. If I could comment, there's one more disaggregation we're going to show, but I think we want to show spring to now to show uh, both, as Obed said, uh, things are, people, families are reporting that this is uh, an improvement from where we were in the spring. And as Obed noted, there's still significant percentages, even at the high school, uh, of, family, of families who are suggesting that at least half, most, or um, each activity, um, there does need to be support. So I think it's, it's important to note, note both the progress uh, and that this still isn't easy. So I think we, we, we sort of want to hold both. And as Dr. Morris mentioned, we also disaggregated by um, families whose children receive special education services. And so we see a little bit more variability in this response mm -hmm. with 12%, uh, only 12% of students being able to complete their work independently um, on each assignment. And then, so yeah, we see a lot more variability on that front and a lot more students requiring um, assistance. I think there's a question, Ms. McDonald, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Mr. Denling, I was staring at the number. CPAC <laughs> did its own survey of parents um, with their experience with um, uh, with uh, remote learning and, and, and some of those challenges. And this this tracks pretty consistently, but I, um, yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was it was the majority of students and families that felt like um, that the the independent uh, nature of not just completing the tasks but actually engaging in the learning objective uh, was was quite challenging. Um, and there was kind of a long tail to their data as well, where you had um, you know a smaller percentage who were really exceptionally struggling, and then a smaller percentage that um, were reporting almost no benefit. Right. So it's um, 
it's interesting when you look when we're looking at a survey of thousands um sometimes those averages are, are good indicators and then you know with a district that's that's so large with so many different types of students even a small percentage of students that are really struggling is obviously a major issue so um it's um i i, I find it helpful that you know two surveys came at it from different angles and are arriving at, at more or less the same conclusion for this population of students. Yeah, and anecdotally, we didn't do the, again, we could have disaggregated uh, indefinitely, but um, we're hearing similar trends for English language learners as well. Um, so, you know, we had active conversations with, you know, Katie Richardson, our ELL coordinator, and she's hearing from staff um, similar trends and, and we're hearing it from um, staff members in the schools as well. Um, so. You know, it's hard. Again, we could have done 80, 100 slides and, and gotten everything, but we wanted to pick some of the highlights because we think they're indicative of, kind of the larger experiences that um, students are having both at the aggregate and then um, at the smaller group level. Any other questions for Obed before we transition to um, a, a new, um, a different set of slides and different set of data? Okay, so in this aspect of the survey, we wanted to inquire about how students, staff, and families were perceiving the remote learning uh, process. And so we asked about things that were going well and uh, aspects of the, of the remote learning that were more challenging. And so for students in the student survey, this was primarily focused on coursework specifically. We got to more general aspects towards the uh, end of the survey, and we'll discuss those later. But as far as coursework, there was a range of responses. And something to note is that there, wasn't, there weren't any subjects that stood out as solely positive or solely negative. So one student, a student may have um, mentioned, for example, math, but then math could have been something that wasn't so, um, didn't go so well for another student. So no single subject was solely positive or negative. So it kind of suggests um, a student by student basis on the class. When we came to staff, um, this was more focused on the aspects of teaching. And so some positive aspects were that the technology allowed staff to facilitate community building among um, between them and their students, as well as between students. Um, staff also reported that they're gaining more facility with the online platforms. Um, with rem um, required for uh, remote learning and that there's more of a consistent and predictable routine from day to day. And lastly, they also reported that um, remote learning allows, considering the current context, more safety for, for both students and staff. And when we got to the families um, in reporting about the positive aspects of their children's uh, coursework, there was a similar reaction. No single subject. This was, uh, yeah, there was no single subject that stood out as solely positive or negative. Um, but there was also a theme of, of parents and families acknowledging that remote learning is not comparable to in-person learning. However, the classes generally are beneficial and they have improved um, from where they were in the spring. And if we're going, and now we're switching to more challenging aspects. It was like we mentioned before, there were a range of responses among students um, about their coursework. Uh, when we got to the staff, sort of uh, primary challenges were providing formal assessments, maintaining consistent student engagement. Um, Dr. Morris touched upon this earlier that, for example, let's say a student logs in, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be engaged throughout the class. So that's um, a common theme that emerged among the responses. Staff also reported um, struggle with being able to obtain information on how students are understanding their material and how they're progressing in their classes in addition to how they're doing their well-being. Um, and other two themes were a lack of time for prep, not enough time for prep, and again, the screen time. And when we got to families, as we mentioned earlier with the more general themes, there was a concern among families about the social emotional development of students and, uh, and the struggles that remote learning um, poses for peer relationships. Um, again, similar to the staff, there was a concern about student engagement and how students were being engaged um, while they were learning. And lastly, um, there was also a concern that with remote learning, while students may be completing their task and their homework, 
there's still a concern that they may not be necessarily learning in the process. Just want to pause to see if there's any questions or comments from the committee before we transition. Okay, you don't see any. any. Okay, so moving on, we also asked uh, students about um, the level of personal connection that they felt in this new, in, in this virtual environment. And as you can see here, almost half indicated that it was the right amount, but it's also worth noting that over a third indicated that it's somewhat too disconnected. And so that's something to be aware of, as well as for the other responses from staff and, and the families. So you see the same thing here for the staff, the ratio between the right amount and somewhat too disconnected is a, even a little bit, is even closer than it was for the students. Um, and you see more, much too, dis much too disconnected. That's something that raised as well. And then among families, we see that same trend as well. So while many people are acknowledging that there is some level of connection, it is also worth noting that for many people, um, they still seem to feel disconnected from their teachers and um, their peers. Yep, and just to, to summarize Obed's points, um, all three were, were roughly consistent that slightly less than half of respondents felt like the right amount of connection, a personal connection was occurring. Um, and that's, uh, we did ask this question last year. This is a significant improvement from where we were. So I wanna thank staff for all the work they've done. That's been a major focus of the professional development that we had in late August and early September is on this topic. And uh, this is not a critique of staff members. This may be a limitation of the structure, right? Um, I don't feel like staff are not emphasizing this or not doing their best efforts on this at all. Um, it may just be that for, for significant numbers of both staff members, families, and students, that the nature of an, uh, a virtual environment lacks the personal connection that's possible uh, in, in schooling that people are more accustomed to. So um, I wanna be really clear that, that this is a large improvement. I wanna thank staff for all their efforts in this regard and suggest that this is still an area of significant challenge for all of us. Um, and to note, you know, there are some differences as, as Obed noted. Um, and there's a lot of consistency in, in all three data points. So if you think of triangulating data or trying to get data from multiple sources telling the same story, uh, rarely do we get it um, through three, from three stakeholder groups that all pretty much align the same way these do. Any questions or comments on this section? Okay. Moving forward, we also inquired um, about how respondents were feeling as far as their level of satisfaction with academic rigor in comparison to last spring. So um, again, we took the responses um, and yeah, we analyzed them. And so for among the students, I mean, in comparison to last spring um, and using um, how classes went then, about almost a third were very satisfied with academic rigor and a little over a third were somewhat satisfied. And then when we consider the staff as well, we see similar trends with a third of staff being very satisfied with the academic rigor in comparison to last spring and a third of staff being somewhat satisfied. When we asked families this uh, question, it was phrased slightly differently. They were asked to rate how the level of rigor and challenge of their child's um, classes and homework. And so you see here over half indicated that it was the right amount of rigor. Um, something to note is that about a quarter of families did respond that the rigor was somewhat too little. And in addition to that question, we also asked respondents in comparison to last year, the level of overall satisfaction with the remote learning process, with a remote learning approach from the district. And so for students, again, about 30, 36% indicated that they were very satisfied. 35% um, indicated that they were somewhat satisfied. For staff, about a quarter indicated that they were very satisfied and almost 40 and 43 percent indicated that they were somewhat satisfied and when we get to the family responses 
um, we see about a third, a little over a third um, of families were either very satisfied and a little over a third were somewhat satisfied. So in comparison to last year, as we saw in the general trends, there is an improvement, but as I hope as you we have been able to see there are nuances within that data. And lastly, we asked students and families to provide some feedback on what the district and staff can be doing to better support them. And so among the students, a uh, theme that came up was um, a request for the district and the staff to consider how best to use class time, especially um, when classes are already lengthy, less homework, more breaks in between classes and more individual check-ins um, would be helpful. And in this sense, check-ins refer to just like wellness check-ins to see how students are doing. Um, among families, there was a request for more community building opportunities. Um, although they, they mentioned that that's something that was going well, they request that they, this be done more. Um, and as Dr. Morris mentioned, we continue to disaggregate these feedback results by school level um, and when disaggregated, it showed differences. And so among the elementary um, school parents, there was a request for more use of paper resources and assignments that can be turned in. And something, a theme of that, would, especially for younger students, um, I, saw, I noticed a trend in parents wanting to um, use paper resources because this would allow their younger students in particular to be able to practice skills such as like their writing skills or comprehension and literacy skills. So using paper resources would help in that regard. Um, when we get to the middle school and high school, there was a request among parents for more consistent and frequent communication from the administrators. Um, and when we get to the high school specifically, many parents were requesting um, more rigor and homework, especially for their, their, student, their children that are college bound juniors and seniors. Mr. Demling? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting um, disaggregation I'm, I, on the family side here. I'm, I, uh, thank you for putting that together. The um, So, um, so Dr. Morris, two questions. One, on the elementary use of paper. So <laughs> I feel like we have to press it, preface 50% of our comments with we're not epidemiologists, but our understanding of COVID has evolved, right, since March. And there is, I think it's safe to say, generally speaking, less concern about physical um, materials transmission than there was initially. Um, at least when this all started. Um, so I don't know how that impacts our capacity for the rest of the year to act on on this kind of request where we more regularly or at a higher volume are, are providing physical materials to, to students. Um, so that was, that was one question. The other on um, on the homework, it's it's funny. I've, act, I've gotten some individual parent feedback and it's kind of been all over the place on the homework. I've gotten and pretty intensely all over the place, you know, not reconcilable consistently. Some saying, oh my gosh, my student needs more homework. And others saying literally that their student has four or more hours of homework a night and feeling like there's not a consistent homework policy um, per school or grade or whatever. So I don't know if you could talk about maybe homework policy and whether that's evolved or or or, or not um, would get in, in this new remote setting. So on the first question, uh, we do have systems set up where elementary teachers can arrange physical resources and students or families come to pick them up on a regular basis. Um, I know um, some of our schools started the year with uh, like a general pickup for every kid and, and a box that people can refresh with papers and um, schools have slightly different systems with that. But um, I think we do have ways to be able to do that that have worked pretty well so far. And I think it's more just um, continuing and refining that work. Um, the homework piece, you're right. I, I think you described it well as there's intensely different responses. We've had families saying, you can penalize my student, but I'm not having my kid be on a screen more than they're already on a screen and they're just not gonna do their homework. Um, to the other extreme of my kids getting no homework and they need it. So I do think there's intensely held beliefs uh, around that. And I think as a result, we are trying to work through, um, through our school leaders and department heads, curriculum leaders to try to get a, uh, more on the same page as it relates to homework. You know, both our middle school and high school are on different schedules than they typically were in the past. So that's another adjustment is um, if you're having semester long classes versus year long classes, that's, you know, one thing is about, well, you have 80 minutes instead of, you know, a significantly shorter time frame. but another piece is what becomes homework and what doesn't. 
Um, and so I think you're right to note that that's an area that we have to grow in and get more consistent. And we'll still have lots of um, people expressing broadly divergent viewpoints on, on the value of that work. I think what Obed said was really important was you know, that was really coming a lot from juniors and seniors. Um, our middle school students and ninth grade students were not asking for more homework. Um, and I think it's, it's worth noting that there perhaps there's a developmental difference as well as uh, where are we in terms of preparing for post high school um, experiences. So uh, I think I agree with you that we're not at the most consistent place. We need to do some work and also that uh, we will not make everyone happy with uh, any decision that's made. But I think the more consistent we are, the better off it is. And it's more clear for families and students and staff members. So we're working on it. Ms. Spitzer. Um, yeah, I just want to lead with, you know, thanking Obed and everybody else involved in this for all of the hard work, not just on this survey, but over time. I think it's especially, you know, for somebody who's still in college, you know, really appreciate the the, the quality of, of, the, of the work you've been doing. Um, I, I guess I have a question about the – we've been getting a lot of surveys over time. You know, I think we're doing more surveying than – Correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like we're doing more surveys than the district has ever done. And so this isn't so much a, a thought, you know, about this survey in particular, but more about the practice of the surveying that we're doing in our community. Because I think it's it's an important way of getting feedback and it's something that I'm, I'm happy we're doing a lot of. Um, I'm not trying to, to be negative about it, but I think, um, you know, I took the survey as a parent and, um, and I also got some feedback from parents as well, you know, and, I'm wondering about like the 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 process when we're creating these surveys in terms of trying to get feedback from those people who are going to be taking like pilot surveying. And I know we don't have a ton of time, we don't have a ton of resources, but is there a process in place where we're trying to get some feedback? Because I, I, for one, for example, was curious about this idea of doing the comparison to last spring because the way those questions were phrased for me were sometimes really tricky to think about. <laughs> Compared to last spring, how satisfied are you with the rigor? When actually what I think I'd like to be able to say is like, like have a few questions about the comparison to last spring. But I think as a district, we actually want to know like how satisfied are you with this rigor overall? And how satisfied are you with the way we're performing, you know, just in general? Because if, if it is, especially as we're talking more long term about this is going to be what we're doing, you know, I, I, I wish it weren't true. I wish we were going to be pivoting to in-person learning quickly, but it seems like we're not. So I, I guess I'm curious about the decision to, to frame the survey around this comparison to last spring. And if there is an idea of kind of just thinking about it, not in comparison to last spring, because everybody kind of acknowledges that last spring was really challenging in so many ways. I think we did as best we could, but it, it's not the standard that I'd want to be comparing us to. I'm happy, really happy to see we're doing a much better job and both um, as a committee member and as a parent, I, I really feel like we are doing a lot better. Um, so two, those are two points. I'm sorry, I was a little long-winded. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I actually was thinking, you know, and you've raised this point before, Carrie, and I think it's a good one uh, about how to get more access. And I actually wonder if there's a role for, and I'm not putting you on the, right, I don't want to make anyone who has an idea then responsible for implementing that. I mean, that's an effective leadership strategy. It's not one I'm trying to employ right now. Um, but um, I do think as committee members, you're closer to the parent community. And I think seen as more kind of uh, neutral non-staff resource. So I do wonder whether there'd be a committee member to next time we're doing a survey who might be able to, you know, with our support, gather a focus group and share feedback on that, because I think that'd be actually a fabulous role uh, and I mean this authentically for a committee member to play because you are connecting with the people who elected you. Um, and, and I think it, your, your access point to get community feedback would be pretty high. And so I do wonder if there's a committee member too, and not that needs to be decided now, um, but who would be interested in, in kind of running those, you know, focus groups or getting feedback um, that then goes back to the administration because I think, I think it'd be a great role for committee, committee members to be involved with. Mr. I, I'm more than happy to um, at least lead that effort, but um, after school hours is my only, I, I will definitely not be able to do it during the working hours, but 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's going to be true for soliciting yeah. feedback from a group, most likely of families, is they're going to have a hard time doing it either because they're working or they're supporting their own children's distance learning. So, yeah, I mean, we could we could work out the logistics of it, but I do think um, it'd be a really nice way for the committee to be connecting with the larger community as well. Is there, um, is there anybody else in the committee that is interested in, in exploring that with Ms. Spitzer? Or just reach out to Ms. Spitzer maybe if you are interested. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Nope. Yep. So, um, I mean, maybe I'll close by saying a couple things. One is, again, thanking Obed for his work uh, over the last couple months. We're excited to be cheering Obed on from the sidelines as he continues his career and goes into being a school psychologist, uh, which is his, his next step in graduate school. So we're thrilled for him and thrilled for the field. So um, appreciate his service. I think as it relates to this service, uh, this survey rather, we are um, going to be taking this in as well as the demographic information I kind of talked bluntly about at the beginning and trying to use this to better uh, our approach towards distance learning and make sure we're reaching uh, and more effectively teaching all of our students. Uh, we know we're in better shape than we were last spring and we've invested a lot of time, energy and resources to get there. And yet we still know we're not there. And as it looks like, and again, not to do the doomsday thing, but uh, restating what I said to be in the meeting, you know, there's no indication that we won't be on a long-term school building closure that we'll be relying on distance learning for an extended period of time. So we have to get this right and we have to get it better than how it is uh, working right now. Um, and so we'll come back to the committee and we'll be able to share uh, are thinking about that, you know, in the next couple of weeks, but uh, we're digging in deep to the survey, not just what we shared here, but but the multiple hundreds of pages of, of anecdotal and qualitative re um, feedback, as well as the quantitative pieces that were shared tonight. So that's sort of our next step on it, is, is digging in and, um, and making this, using the survey to better our students' experience. And then perhaps with Terry's help, uh, offering her a fine survey, maybe as we hit midwinter, um, to check in how it's going, um, you know, that many months in and, and seeing if any of the adjustments are realized, the, the, the adjustments, uh, the impact of the adjustments are realized in the data that we gather. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Oben, and wish you Absolutely. success. Okay. Um, so moving on to our next item, um, uh, we are looking at a quarter one budget update. So um, I, I guess turning that over to you, Dr. Slaughter. Yep. Doug, do you have this, the pages or do you want me to project them? I'm if happy you, to do that if you'd like. If you could project them, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. And we'll, we'll start with the memo, I think, first. The memo, okay. It's going to take me a second to pull it up. So why don't you, you can definitely start and then I'll I'll get it up in a second. There's not a lot of uh, great visual on that. It's a lot of text, but uh, I want to start with the memo first, which was which was an attempt by me to uh, explain sort of the circumstances which we're operating relative to uh, financial support from the federal level through the state uh, to help us uh, as, we, as we navigate this year and the, and the pandemic, um, but also to sort of point out where we're headed relative to that. Um, and so I wanted to start with just the, the complexity of it and the fact that there are five different sources of, 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 uh, of potential revenue that have arisen uh, this year, um, the different ways in which they support us and the, and the different uh, funding levels in which they support us. And so um, that's really the first sort of a page or so of the, of the memo is just, our, you know, sort of outlining those, those uh, different programs that are there and, and uh, it's one thing to keep in mind is, you know, we have uh, the Municipal Cares Act and, and the municipal, the, the federal Cares Act is really split into the bottom four choices. So there's the FEMA, which is our, you know, standard federal uh, uh, emergency relief and uh, management agency support of in, during disasters. The other four all stemmed from the Cares Act that the that the uh, federal government passed and, and uh, distributed out to, to states. And so. Uh, 
the state of Massachusetts split things up in a couple different ways to help us out. Um, and so I, I just want to articulate those a little bit and, and there are differing you know, sort of rules of the road as it were, and, and to, uh, to also recognize uh, the extreme and diligent efforts of a, a whole host of staff in trying to uh, get our heads around what we needed, when we needed it, where we needed it, how much of it we needed, uh, and while at the same time sort of simul, you know, presuming there would be these funds to help cover those costs. Um, and so, you know, as you can see in the in the second table there, uh, it's a series of, of uh, school specific grant programs that the state put together and, and the funding we got at each of the different districts. Uh, and that is correct. Twenty three dollars is the right number there on, on Palm. It looks funny because what they did is you submitted a cost and then they give you a percentage of that uh, based on how many people applied this thing. So it, it seems a little unusual, but it was a true award for twenty three dollars. Uh, the key thing to keep in mind about all of those is is we've committed all those funds and and, and or spent them already. Um, and to be perfectly honest, the CARES Act money that we have uh, for Amherst directly with the town and for the region through the, the town of Amherst predominantly, but the other communities, uh, is pretty much all committed. Um, and so at this point, uh, the the money is uh, is is spent or is accounted for or is is. Uh, projected to be utilized, most of it by the end of December, because that was the requirement of those funding sources. Um, and so needless to say, uh, one of the things that that is a significant concern as we move ahead um, is, is a couple of things. One is the timing. So there are certain things the state, you know, sort of rules they put in place uh, relative to what would be deemed FEMA eligible expenses, many of which are not truly FEMA eligible, or they, you know, as the rules are more and more defined relative to FEMA, uh, we're still required to sort of apply for them and then get rejected, and then the state will will reimburse us the rest. So there's a timing issue there. It's not that we won't get reimbursed for those, and as we were planning the spending, we knew that those funds weren't necessarily going to ever be FEMA eligible, but at the same time, we still have to kind of go through the mechanics of that. But there's a timing issue because we have to wait for FEMA, who's getting requests from every community in the nation uh, to, to sort of get back to us and say, no, that doesn't apply. And then we can re reach out to the state for reimbursement. So it's a timing issue. So that, that creates a, a cash flow problem potentially for us. Um, and mostly it's it's a headache for me, not so much uh, uh, the fact that we won't get reimbursed. Um, but it, is a, it is a timing issue because when we will truly be able to uh, take in those resources to cover those costs uh, is indeterminate at this point. Um, needless to say, the invoices from the companies we bought stuff from are showing up every day. Um, and so that's that's one concern we have as we go through the just the mechanics of how that works and that sort of thing. But the second piece I think is more critical is the fact that there's a number of the things that we are purchasing currently and, and uh, less so with goods or materials, although some of that, but more with services that we are we are purchasing. Uh, to support our students in a number of ways, those don't magically disappear on December 30th. Um, and so we've got a number of things that we're going to need to continue at least through this year, maybe into next year, um, to support our students and to make our schools safe for our staff so they can support our students. Um, and, you know, at, at this moment, without a, another uh, CARES Act or something similar to support us, uh, things are going to get very difficult very quickly. And, and to be honest, we, we're making plans now, but it really, if we don't have something identified in the next few weeks, um, we're going to have to take some significant action uh, within our budget this current year to just manage our resources to, to still provide what we need to for the students and, and to uh, get ourselves to the end of this fiscal year and, and prepare for fiscal 22. And then it looks like Mr. Dimmel has a question, so I'm going to pause and give me a chance to ask that question. Mr. Yeah. Dimmel. Yes, I appreciate you being so clear and direct about the situation. Um, I just lost the phrase that you just heard, um, uh, that you just used, um, that you may in the next few weeks need to take some, what did you say, like clear clear action? Could you, could you like describe what, like what, what you mean by that a little, a little further if you could? Well, you know, one of the things that, you know, has happened to us in years past when, when uh, you know, financial crises have happened is that we go into uh, spending freezes. So any uh, discretionary spending at all that we have, we, we will freeze. And so we won't buy any more uh, material goods and that sort of things. Uh, you know, 
that's a small part of our budget, but it can make a difference. Um, we went into last spring, we went into a frost, I think is the term we use instead of a freeze. So it was really uh, trying to limit our expenditure uh, and be very, very conscientious about our choices there. Um, that's, you know, an immediate first step that we take. Um, it, it could involve changes to uh, staffing. And and some of this will depend upon, as, as, as Dr. Morris indicated, you know, what's our likelihood of being in person the building will change if if we know we're going to be not in our building for an extended time can we restructure ourselves in a way that uh reduce our labor costs to be perfectly blunt and and and, and superintendent morris may want to speak more uh specifically to that issue but but it's it's really uh, a circumstance where a lot of things are off the table uh you know or or on the table that might not normally be considered on the table sorry um, and I think another thing, you know, and, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit as we talk about our, our, uh, you know, the actual quarterly, you know, first quarter sort of expenditures is some areas we know we won't be spending as much money on uh, that we have anticipated uh, and had to plan for spending money on uh, that we won't. So transportation, for example, utilities is another one off the top of my head. Uh, there are a few of those kind of things that will come in under budget. There are other things that, uh, because of the unpredictability of our circumstances, we have to plan to do things that we may not have to do. And so we have to be prepared to spend if those things arise. Um, you know, we feel we've bought a, a fair amount of PPE and, and hopefully enough to sort of carry us through uh, most of, if not the rest of the year. If we don't go in person, we've got more PPE than we know what to do with. If, you know, like if, if for some reason, and I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but I mean, if, if we were not go back to in-person school until, I don't know, pick a date, August of next year. <laughs> um, we've got a lot of PPE on hand that, that won't get utilized, but we will, um, so we won't be buying any additional. Um, on the other hand, if we go to in-person school sooner and we start going through and utilizing a lot more of those types of items, then we may need to make an additional purchase later in the, in the year. And so we've gotta be making plans about those resources, how much we use, um, as we go along. So it's it's gonna be, uh, you know, there are gonna be some very difficult conversations and and actions that we have to take to, to keep our budgets uh, within the money that is available to us. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be a busy year to say the least in that regard. If I could add um, just briefly, uh, if it's okay with the chair um, to Dr. Slaughter's response. I think I just want to add two specific things is one is just trying to figure out the cost structure and resource allocation, depending on the model. So, you know, Dr. Slaughter referenced um, some of the materials, but also, you know, if we were going to be a virtual school indefinitely, we would have different cost structures and resource management. Um, if we weren't, then we would, we would adjust that. So uh, we are starting to have to plan on that second scenario where we're in virtual for an extended period of time. Um, I think the second thing, this is getting a little ahead of myself because we, we want to see what the financial picture is from the town of Amherst, because um, that has not just because of the Amherst Public Schools, but that has large implications for the region as well, um, given it's about 79% or thereabouts, um, is um, if we are going to have a particularly difficult year next year, I think we're actually going to actively going to have to have very difficult conversations if we choose to spend the full amount of school choice reserve funds that we allocated for this year's budget. Um, once that money's gone, that money's gone. And so I don't say that lightly, uh, but it is going to have to be something that that comes up for the committee, uh, because if we're feeling like we're going to need those funds next year, um, because of what the financial picture describes, we may want to actively have some of the conversations about what we do this year. Um, most years, there is a direct connection between one year and the next. This is a, an unusual year that we opted to use significantly more choice reserve funds than what we're bringing in. We don't do that. We've never done that before. We did it because the extraordinary circumstances we found ourselves in and find ourselves in now. And so if this is gonna look like it's an ongoing thing, we really do have to have some very challenging conversations of what we do with this year's budget and the impact on next year's budget as well. Um, so we'll know more about that on Monday, and that's why I'm, I'm just foreshadowing. I don't know what Monday is going to be. Um, I don't know what uh, Mr. Mangano is going to present. Um, he, he talked to us a couple weeks ago with some initial thoughts, and I have not looped back to him. So once we have that information, I think we will actually have to talk about this year's budget. Um, and depending what model we're in, you know, where resources go. 
Um, so we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks. Um, so I don't, that's probably as far as I'm willing to, to, to get in specificity because we want to see what FY22, uh, what the beginnings of that look like. And right now that's not a known thing. It's 5.30, I think, on Monday for anyone in the public who's interested in watching uh, that presentation for what it's worth as well. That's right. And so the last point, so the last point in the memo and, and, and is, is along the lines of what, what Dr. Morris was just speaking of, but one other thing that I'll mention is that what we're seeing in a lot of schools are seeing is a drop in enrollment. Um, I think that's happening, you know, not just to public schools, but I think, uh, well, charter schools are public schools, but they're also in, in that regard, choice uh, students are, are down in a lot of school districts. Um, the really tricky thing I'll point out relative to the coming year for us, and 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 again, this harkens back to an earlier comment uh, Superintendent Morris mentioned about uh, our representative Dom reaching out to the to the uh, representatives in in the legislature around education is around uh, Chapter seventy eight, and and so um, your enrollment in October of uh, this year, October of twenty one, is utilized when they calculate the. Chapter 78 in roughly January, you know, December, January, when they're putting the budget together for fiscal 22. And so to have a significant drop this year, but then potentially regain those students next year uh, is, is going to be a difficult circumstance for a lot of, of districts. Um, and so along with that, of course, is, is the similar thing that might happen or will happen relative to, to school choice is that we, we have a revolving fund that helps us uh, sort of smooth out peaks and valleys in our enrollments in, 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 uh, in school choice, but we have it there as a resource and we utilized it for, for fiscal 21. The difficulty is, is that as we move into fiscal 22 and beyond, uh, we can't continue to do that because we're, our, our, you know, our income level from, from school choice versus our expenditure from school choice is out of balance in a pretty significant way this year and potentially next year, depending on the choices we make and, and how things are, are going to play out. So that's really the last point on the memo is, is how those two pieces are are uh, are shaping up as we as we move into budget season and uh, wanting to make you aware of you know concerns we have and things we're going to need to be uh, deciding debating and and seeking understanding from and advocating for as we move into budget season. I think I'll pause there in case there are other questions relative to to that memo. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so not specific to our district, but um, so in general, when you talk about this idea that on December 30th, everything but the ESSER grant expires. And so if we don't identify a new grant program in the next six to eight weeks, that significant and severe financial actions will need to be taken. Like you just described in general, what those kinds, kinds of things would be. I would imagine every district in the Commonwealth is in the same boat, right? And so um, has, has this come up in conversations with, with Rep Dome or with, with Senator Comerford or or have there been initial conversations with the town? Because I mean, if we're if we're sitting here as the school district, we either put our hat out to the town or the state, or we reduce the size of the hat, right? And we, nobody wants to reduce the size of the hat. And so I'm wondering if this must come up on like superintendent calls and, and whatnot. So I'm just wondering what the thinking is. Yeah, everybody's um, fingers are tired from being crossed for so long, um, and. Um, you know, even in this fraught political national environment, it did look like two weeks ago, there was at least some movement to getting a deal done that have funds for schools. And then it, and obviously it didn't happen. Um, so it, it is a major concern. I think we've got some unique pieces, uh, you know, uh, some of the spending we did like at, at Wildwood and at Fort River was pretty large scale spending uh, around, you know, changing structures, particularly at Fort River was a pretty expensive project. Um, we purchased significantly more uh, PPE per staff member than what was recommended by the state. So, you know, I think we are well suited uh, for a while on that front. Again, I don't anticipate uh, not. To, I, I don't want to. I don't like the phrase "beat a bit, beat a dead horse," but like you know, I don't see us coming back in person particularly soon. So, you know, an odd way that makes me feel more comfortable. Um, with the PPE, and we've had a very small percentage of our students come in for a total of seven days. So we are well stocked, so to speak. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I do feel we, we'll have the last round of air quality testing done, I think, uh, next week uh, and the results maybe the week after that. 
So, uh, you know, I do feel like we're getting to the end of some of the unknowns that, uh, and they're, they're trending to the positive in terms of the initial reports we received from the consultants. So um, I do think, you know, we're feeling, I'm feeling, you know, comfortable, but there, you know, we don't know what the future holds. Um, and I think that's, that's the hard thing. But, you know, in terms of some of the variables that we're hanging out there, do we need to change entire schools, HVAC systems and things like that. You know, again, we, we keep on getting individual rooms that need some work that our staff can mostly handle, or we don't use a room or two in a school, but um, we've been really pleased with with some of the large scale work. So I, I do feel like we're, I wanna say over the hump, but I think we, we have some variables that we've, uh, could have went either way that went in the way of the district, thanks to the good work of our facilities and maintenance crew over the years. Um, but we don't exactly know what the, the winter and spring will hold. And I think that's sort of the the unknown variable that um, makes it particularly difficult to plan for. Sorry, long-winded way of um, honestly not answering your question. So um, that that's sort of where, uh, but that that is where I am in my thinking. And, and in terms of superintendents, we all just assume that we'll get to the end of second quarter and third quarter, and and have less of an idea of exactly where we are in our budgets than we've ever had before, um, and have to adjust from there, um, just because our spending patterns are wildly different than they've ever been. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll take us into the, the quarter one reports. The, the two reports are, are very, very similar to each other. So there's not, a, I'll, I'll probably talk of them in, in, uh, in, in sort of uh, simultaneously, I guess, as a way to describe it. Um, I mean, the short story is that for most areas of the budget, we're, we're doing fine. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, we've been doing a lot of spending, but it's been the money we were just talking about and not, you know, our own budget. We've been spending our own budget as, in many ways as we would have expected. Um, you know, there are three areas in, in both of these budgets that I that I will point out as areas that, you know, are deeply concerning to us and we are gonna have to take action and and utilize funds within the budget to move to those areas, but also, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some support for those things uh, from potentially another, uh, you know, sort of outside source. Um, but I think I'll talk about the sort of positives first, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, substitutes, uh, you know, the uh, substitutes we've used, you see none in, in region, but in Amherst, there are some uh, that's largely paying our own staff to cover for each other if they need to be out, uh, you know, having other people come in has been a much, much smaller thing. Uh, our salaries have been very, very modest. Uh, there are positions we intentionally did not fill um, and, and have held open uh, to uh, and to, you know, in anticipation of of uh, needing that revenue to help support other things. Um, and as you go through most of the rest of the green areas, uh, you know, they're, they're spending at pace of about 25% is the percent of budget used, or it's a little above that at times. Sometimes that's about encumbering money in preparation for spending that will happen fairly soon. Um, you have some encumbrances and things uh, that that come up and where the lion's share of the spending happens early in the year. So in the IS department, there's a number of software renewal that, that happened at the beginning of the year. That happens in some other departments as well. And so you look at those and see 70% spent out of the IS sort of line and, and you know, you worry that we won't get there from here. But, but you know, there's a big chunk of, of expenditure in the early part of the year in those, in those areas. Um, the three areas that we marked and, and you know, uh, thought about most deeply is, is that contracted service area of, of, of our, our uh, sort of payroll area. Um, part of why that's at that level right now is is over the summer. Uh, so after July 1, but over the summer, there was a, a, a significant amount of compensatory services that we had to to uh, to to uh, to offer to kids and, and to provide to children. Um, and that was, uh, needless to say, above budget. Um, and and much of it, if not all of it, is is was ineligible and remains ineligible for for support from these uh, supporting uh, uh, grant monies from the state and, and the feds. And so that's, you know, it, it's a tricky area. And as we move forward, there's there's going to be continued expense in that area. Doug, can I just jump in? So compensatory services are typically services that are delivered for students with special needs when they haven't receive the services as that are consistent with their IEP. So um, Desi put out, the state put out a guide to help us understand given last spring's uh, experience, um, how to provide compensatory services. And as Dr. Dahl Slaughter describes, uh, well, that part of it is perhaps, you know, mostly complete um, with the current service delivery model we have, we are anticipating 
needing to provide, continue to provide compensatory services uh, for students who can't access some of their services virtually uh, to make effective progress towards the IEP. So uh, that's one of the reasons in red isn't just that it's at 29%, it's actually that we imagine that number to grow over time. Um, so it is a, a cause of concern for us financially. We're always going to do the right thing by kids. And um, sometimes the right thing by kids isn't inexpensive. Um, but particularly for our students with special needs, we are providing additional services. We're trying to front end that service. So we don't need compensatory services next summer. And uh, we think that's both in the kids' best interest and the fiscal best interest. Um, but, um, you know, we didn't budget for that. Um, and so that is a cause of concern fiscally, um, not a cause of concern educationally. It's, it's the right thing to do. We, we're going to do it because uh, that's what we do. Um, but I just wanted to share that it's a special education, not all contracted, but much of what we're talking about here is contracted services for students with special needs. Right. And, and to build on that, I think it, the next area of, of concern is, is under uh, special education expenditure. And it's labeled slightly differently between the two, uh, the Amherst and the and the the regional charts, but but nonetheless, uh, you know, it, it's a similar uh, you know area of concern and, and and expenditure. There are things we are doing in a remote environment um, that, uh, again, you know, uh, there is some support and there has been some support from these uh, CARES programs and CARES Act uh, funds, uh, but we're not sure what that entails as we move into the the second half of the of the fiscal year, and so. Uh, you know, it, it's not that we can't do the work we need to do. We have requirements and, and obligation, both moral and legal, um, that we need to, to take care of. And, and so uh, then we have to, you know, find the financial resources to make those things happen the way they need to. Um, the third area is in the facilities area. And again, I think this this gets into, you know, sort of back to the idea of, of some of those uh, efforts and, and uh, activities that we're doing to keep our buildings safe and clean and sanitized and materials that we're buying to protect staff if they're in the building. And, you know, even though you know, the kids aren't in school, there are people in our buildings. And so there is work that's being done and, and ongoing uh, that is different than we've done in the past relative to our cleaning and sanitizing procedures. And so uh, I'm in the office, you know, pretty much every day. And uh, there are things they're doing in my office every day that's very different than in years past. And that's not a complaint or yeah, I'm glad they're doing them, but at the same time, those aren't, uh, you know, those weren't uh, necessarily budgeted for. Um, and like I said, as we go into the second half of the year, the the resources that we've applied to to uh, fund those types of activities and those things, um, you know, are there's not a support sitting out there for us right at the moment. So we have to really keep an eye on that as we move ahead. Um, you know, the, you know, the bright spots, uh, transportation will cost us a little bit less. Uh, you know, utilities will probably cost us a little bit less. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are a few other areas like that that will, uh, by nature of, of how we're operating this year, uh, will will come in under what we thought we would, um, which will help support, you know, the areas of the budget that are going to be above what we expected. That's always the, the thing we do as we work through our budget. Um, so I think, you know, uh, in, in the memo that I shared with you and then also here on 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 these two documents for both uh, the regional schools and the and the Amherst schools, um, you know, sort of articulate the the circumstance we find ourselves in. We're sitting, as is in the case for quite a while now, in a lot of unknowns, um, and uh, you know we're we're beginning to get a handle on how we're approaching that uh, set of unknowns. But but again, uh, we're going to have to be uh, nimble and. I think, quite frankly, clever, depending on what happens relative to support from the outside. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and entertain any questions that people have relative to this budget. So I, I have an initial question, um, and I, I think you said this, so maybe this is just a sort of restating for make sure I'm understanding it, is when you talk about the compensatory services um, and sort of that being read in both, both budgets, um, and, and that the concern is not just where we are at, at, at in the first quarter, but where we may end up as, as the year progresses. Thinking about that year progresses, is that of a concern considering that we will that we are very likely to continue in an all remote environment and so that will just keep getting bigger? Or 
it, and if it were, um, if we were in back into some more um, in-person services, does that sort of become a little bit less of a, a red, a red flag um, on the budget? Um, it, it's a little hard to be explicit in the answer because we haven't received the compensatory services guide for this year. Um, you know, we, we were talking about last spring, um, but I, I think the anecdotal feedback and I think a school member referenced the CPAC survey uh, a little while ago indicated that um, families are expressing concern about whether they can effectively receive the services, all their services virtually. Um, and um, I think that could lead to conversations about how those services and how those pro how the progress and how goals are met individually. It really depends on the students. Some students may, you know, the virtual environment works really well and there's uh, students with special needs and, and they may be making effective progress that way. But if there's evidence that there's regression um, and that services aren't delivered, then both we have an ethical and then, you know, potentially legal obligation to provide those compensatory services. Um, so, you know, I think there's a really broad group when you think about students with special needs, but there certainly are students with special needs um, whose families are expressing real concerns about uh, the nature of uh, making the goals towards progress and whether they're able to access the resources and services that um, they need to. So. I think you know it's a we're you know Dr. Brady is working really hard. We do we thank staff who are doing in pro, in home services, um, but even that some of the goals around social emotional uh, functioning and socialization are hard to realize in in that setting as well. So um, you know it, it's it's something we're keeping an eye on. But I think as Dr. Brady always says, the I in IEP is individual, so it, it really does range based on the special need of the individual student. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I would just add a brief comment, you know, to, just to add some context to that, since, you know, I've been the CPAC meetings where we've discussed um, the survey results, which include a lot of comments and parent feedback, is that, I mean, what we what we know for sure, what is absolutely clear is that we have a non-zero number of students with significant special needs who cannot access their education through the remote environment. And point blank, that like, that's, that's, Full stop. I mean, and you know, you can you can go uh, talk about what well, what is that number exactly? Um, but it's definitely not zero, and it's definitely more than a handful. So I think as it relates to the context of this budget and what we project um, going forward, if 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 we do end up being mostly remote for the year, is that we're we're definitely going to have some level of compensatory services. Um, you know, like Dr. Morris says, it depends on the IP, right? You got to like uh, make that assessment and. And you know, devils in the details, but um, but it's 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 certainly certainly reality. And I, I think I think the the CPAC survey and the feedback from parents at CPAC has made that very clear: is that we have some number of students who who you know have have not progressed since March. And and it's 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 through no fault of the effort of the staff or the or the district. Um, um, you know that that's never come up as a theme. Um, at all, it's it's just the nature of of some students with significant special needs and 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 what we can deliver in the remote environment. Any other questions for Ms. Spitzer? I'm I'm just wondering when we'll get an update on the transportation savings. If um, just because it it is a that's the one potential positive that we have if we can continue to stay closed um, that might offset. And, and then this may be going back a little bit to the, the memo, but it, I mean, here we're looking at the expenses, but what we also wanna be looking at is the potential revenue. And, and you mentioned in the memo at the very end, and the hold harmless provisions of the State Student Opportunity Act, which this past year mitigated any drop in aid due to lower foundation enrollment will likely not be able to be fully sustained in fiscal year 22. Is that because of the advocacy by the, that I'm getting the, my memory is blanking right now, but there was a movement to, to change the hold harmless um, language. And I'm just wondering if anybody had an update on the fate of that. And if that's what you're referring to here, is it the potential for that, um, Right. And we lost due to that political movement. Yeah. I can answer the second part, if that's okay, Dr. Slaughter. So I think that's what I referenced towards the beginning of the meeting with uh, Representative Dom and some of her advocacy of the Education Commission. Um, 
my, my job is to advocate for the Amherst public schools, Amherst regional, you know, schools and tell them. Uh, I think the counter argument to that is that hold harmless uh, in a financially, in a resource poor environment that Massachusetts may be in. Um, Massachusetts last year passed the Student Opportunity Act, which was to, was intended to greatly fund um, areas that had lower funding, uh, typically urban areas, areas of high concentrations of poverty. The idea of where that money is gonna come from is really an open question now. So I think it's not just the Boston-based group that's raising this, it's, um, it's a little bit larger about how is the state gonna fund its commitments to equity uh, in funding of districts and, and I'm always going to do the advocacy. My job is to do the advocacy. That's why, you know, talk to representatives and, and all that. But I do want to be fair that there are people who uh, are working in urban districts when they hear hold harmless um, and they're not going to get the millions of dollars that they were uh, rightfully entitled to based on Student Opportunity Act, right? The pie may not be big enough to do both of those things. And so I think there is an authentic policy debate about how to approach that. Uh, my job, because that's what I'm paid to do is going to be an advocate for these three districts. But I want to also balance the equation that if I was working for the Worcester public schools or the Holyoke public schools, and I heard the Amherst regional schools talking about hold harmless because we have students who went to private school, I might have a, a different policy interest than what we might all share in our self-interested way, rightfully self-interested. That's what we're here to do. Um, so, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, yes, there is an advocacy group doing work on that, but there are other people who are, not part of a Boston-based advocacy group who are also advocating, you know, if there has to be funds cut, it shouldn't come from Student Opportunity Act because that's supposed to be an equalizer and hold harmless is sort of this relic of a political compromise a long time ago and how are we maintaining it? So I'm not advocating against our own interests. I just want to balance that um, in, in, in an environment where finances are going to likely be very tight in, in the Commonwealth, there's going to be some really hard decisions that the Commonwealth makes on that um, and I think there's legitimate arguments to be made at a policy level on both sides of that debate. Sorry for that like long-winded piece. I just wanted to be really, really fair about that. And ethically, I, I need to say it, and I'm absolutely still going to, you know, do all the things I can to bring more resources to our districts. Can I just say I wasn't trying to advocate on either side of that. I'm just trying to understand the status of it because I know it had been of debate, and I'm, and it sounds like the status is undetermined yet, and it hasn't been figured out. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I think it's still, you know, I just wanted to point it out because there was all this media coverage that I think wasn't all that helpful, uh, probably in defining some of the core issues uh, in the Bay. And so at this point, what we got from what I received from um, via Rep Dom is that there's recognition on the Education Committee that this is something that needs to be discussed and worked out. And they're dedicated to trying to problem solve it. And that's where we are. Uh, Dr. Slaughter, did you want to add to that? Just a small thing. I, I, I would suggest, you know, the, the, my intention was less about the policy question, more about just the, the broader, um, you know, sort of in the memo, my, my indication was, was much more focused on the fact that, you know, the state revenues are going to be down, how much they're going to be down, we're not sure, and that'll probably have a negative impact on just the resources available regardless of how they ultimately get sliced within the chapter 70 formula. That policy question is also an important one that's gotten a lot of uh, press as, as the superintendent mentioned. Um, and I think it's a complex enough one that personally, and this is a personal opinion, I, I'm not sure they're gonna resolve that in three months. Uh, you know, so they'll probably try to come up with some, uh, you know, modest compromise to, to manage the crisis of the financial crisis that we'll, we'll be in for the coming year. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully that'll foster the deeper, richer conversation that needs to happen around uh, that whole policy issue. Mr. Benning, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, so just to answer Ms. Spitzer's question real quick, the status of the hold harmless advocacy, it's, it's really two parts. One is pre-pandemic as part of the SOA bill itself, uh, there was a study required um, by DESE and the DOR to study minimum local contribution and part of that is 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 how hold harmless fits in in that so that's so that's the advocacy um letter that we did a, a few meetings ago uh as in, in input to that study so that study is there and it's going off and whatever the schedule that happens in addition there's this whole unknown of omg what's going to happen with funding for schools next year right and and given all the political uncertainty 
everybody is kind of freaking out right now about what's on the table and what kind of dramatic things could happen. And so outside of that other normal process, that study that we input, input into, there is fear that things like hold harmless and other things, regional transportation reimbursement, all these other kinds of things that we rely on could get slashed. And, and as everybody fights for this pie, that's too small. So that's kind of two, two parallel threads. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer? I think the question about when we'll know more about transportation um, didn't get answered. Um, I'm sorry, I, could, I can report on that. I forgot that you'd asked that question. Um, so we, you know, we have uh, negotiated a, uh, I believe it's an MOA, a memorandum of agreement um, with our bus company. We have a single company now instead of two with our, with our contract. Um, you know, there's a there's a few provisions that are sort of you know around specific things like sanitizer on the bus and who's doing it and how much that costs. Those are pretty minor. Um, there are some things around how they'll support us around uh, bus monitors if we don't have enough staff that can perform that role, and they do have staff that can perform that role. But the the primary one uh, that has the biggest impact is the is that on on remote days like the ones we're in currently. Uh, we negotiated a 75 percent of the full cost um, and part of the reason for that in the spring we, it was 50 percent um, that was a different circumstance in that circumstance uh, they uh, laid off all their drivers so all their drivers were claiming and and, and uh, taking unemployment um, in the fall in order to keep and retain the drivers especially in a circumstance where they may be on and then off and then on and then off they feel like we need, you know, they need to keep them on payroll, and and in order to uh, essentially uh, survive and to retain the drivers, uh, they needed to be able to support uh, some form of payment to those to those staff uh, during these remote only days, um, and so that's why the percentage is a little higher. Interestingly, there's a small provision in the in the original existing contract that you know if you're not a lawyer and you read it you might see the same sort of oh 75 percent for one of those kind of days so it's parallels what's a structure that exists in our contract now but um so you know the more days that we spend uh remote uh our transportation costs are three quarters of what they would be so there's 25 percent of, of that chunk of the budget um but then when we do transport there's potential for additional costs above what we expect because of the you know, number of kids that will fit on a bus uh, by virtue of the rules that are in place, um, the monitors that will be on the on those on those buses, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's hard to tell at this point. It depends on you know the longer we are remote, the more likely it is we we save some money relative to what we budgeted. Um, but it's a little hard to tell exactly what you know to quantify at this point. I guess is the way to describe it. Okay. Does anybody that hasn't asked any questions have any any questions? Seeing none. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Slaughter. That was thorough and helpful. <laughs> Dr. Morris. Just, um, I just want to do a uh, kind of agenda check. So, you know, we do have a meeting scheduled for next Tuesday that doesn't have too many new items on the agenda. Um, I'm not doing anything else tonight. I'm not pushing anyone, but I just want to note that we're, you know, um, because of the depth of the conversation, and the questions, you know, we're, we're at two hours now. And um, I just wanted to at least give the, the committee the opportunity if they wanted to look at the agenda and see if what they wanted to keep and what perhaps they want to push on next week since we we don't have that many heavy items next week. Yep. I was I was thinking along the same lines. <laughs> so, so, um, so I I'm, I'm going to sort of survey the room um, and I, I might propose that we move. Um, we I, I think we can tackle the next item um, the superintendent goals vote and then maybe the, the next two items D and E we move to um, the next week's meeting. And those are the discussing the advocacy work for FY22 um, and then beginning the conversation um, or exploring um, the, the calendar and school year structure for FY for school, school year 22. Um, so I'll just glance around my screen to see what um, the committees are thinking about on that. 
Um, seeing lots of thumbs up. Um, and just as a as a comment, so we we have the meeting. Um, we've mentioned that um, the Amherst School Committee is has a joint meeting with the Amherst Town Council and the Jones Library Board of Trustees on Monday, um, which is the annual Amherst um, Town Financial Indicators meeting for the next year's budget. Um, and then right now we have tentatively a meeting of just the regional school committee on Tuesday, November tenth. Um, so. If I'm seeing everybody is pretty much okay with that, so we'll make that um, change. Um, and we can come back to this when we get to item F, future agenda planning. <laughs> um, so the uh, next item is our is item C, the superintendent goals, which are also um, this is the second time we've talked about it. So we, um, Dr. Morris presented these at um, our last joint meeting. Um, my understanding is the Pelham School Committee has has already voted on these. So the um, it's just the region and the Amherst School Committee that need to um, review and, and vote on these as our as Mike uh, Dr. Morris's goals for this school year. Thank you for projecting this. Is there any um, questions, comments, discussion before we move to a vote? I'm not seeing any. Uh, so uh, would somebody from the region like to make a motion? Um, I move that the Regional School Committee approve um, these superintendent goals as presented for the 2021 school year. Lord second. Thank you. Moved by Spitzer, second by Lord. We'll take a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. The motion passes uh, seven to zero, unanimously. Um, and I will move for the Amherst School Committee to approve the proposed superintendent goals for the school year 2020-21. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Harrington. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. And, um, that motion passes unanimous, unanimously 5 0. Lord, aye. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> and I even wrote it down in alphabetical order. <laughs> um. Great. So um, as discussed, we will move the next two items to our next um, regional school committee meeting. Um, and for next week, for that meeting, so the Amherst meeting is Amherst committee's meeting on, on Monday um, with a, as part of that joint meeting. Um, and then the region meeting on Tuesday, we have the um, MOA for uh, AFSCME um, to vote on that. Um, graduation requirements for the school year. If I could just give one sentence of context not to discuss, but just that is um, looking at the high school's graduation requirements, understanding that we're in a different schedule this year and given last spring, we'll be bringing a proposal to adjust the graduation requirements um, for the high school and for Summit Academy. It's been worked on collaboratively with the administrative team at both schools. Um, so the context is that we'd like to present um, an adaptation um, given the courses, the different schedule and the different amount of courses students were able to take to make sure that um, no students are penalized for the um, COVID related changes that we've had to make. So that's the discussion point next week. For um, should C 
seeing the uh, financial indicator summary, should the should that be a joint meeting with Amherst next week as well, or? I was thinking that it might be good to actually have as a region meeting because the Amherst School Committee will meet in a public meeting where they're able to talk about that and ask questions, whereas the implications for region seem making sure that our regional colleagues are aware of what's being presented at Amherst because it has implications. So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not wed to that, but that was my thinking. Okay. Ms. Spitzer. I was also wondering if we should make it a joint meeting just because I feel like the changes to the calendar and the school year structure will actually be very relevant to Amherst. I can't see us changing one without the other. Like, we could be able to talk about what the impact on the elementary schools would, would be nice, I think, at that meeting. It's probably the first two items would be region only and then the others. Okay, great. Any other comments, thoughts from the committees? Ms. Ms. Spitzer? Sorry, I, I, I just think because um, of what Dr. Morris brought up with the um, issue with different absentee rates, it, I'm not saying it should be on the November 10th meeting, but it seems like a topic worthy of future discussion at a school committee meeting. Um, Again, it's it's feeling like there's a lot on the tenth, and maybe we'll get more data later on too. That might make it a richer discussion in the future. But I'd I'd love to stay updated on that and get involved in the conversation. Mr. Deming, um, I don't know if this would be a sub bullet under a general advocacy item, but there's a a growing uh, push statewide to. Uh, advocate for uh, no MCAS this year and, and some for MCAS moratorium. Um, Senator Comerford has been involved in some of that. Um, the MASC annual assembly is voting on it this Saturday as like a delegate assembly, but in addition, school committees are also voting on it. It's not like it has to be next week thing, but um, given that MASC is voting on it this weekend, um, some uh, and our community may be uh, interested in as well, um, maybe something for... Um, I don't know, the 17th or the 24th, maybe. Okay. okay. Any other thoughts? Dr. Just, Morris? Just to note that I think the 24th is Tuesday night, which is, um, the week of Thanksgiving, not that we, the group couldn't meet, but, and I know many people aren't traveling, but it may still be a time that people want to. Yeah. Do, possibly. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not going anywhere, but, uh, but, you know, just wanted to note that for people. Yeah. I was trying to remember when that was. Um, and we've also noted that tentatively um, looking to schedule the four towns um, meeting for the, for the region. Um, the, either the 5th or the 12th, um, though I think our, our preference is the 5th. Um, so more to come on that. Any other thoughts right now? If anybody has any, um, any thoughts after this meeting, um, feel free to e email me um, uh, afterward at any time before. Uh, Looks like we were pretty full for the 10th, but for the 17th, um, have plenty of time for that. Great. So we'll um, move on now to a warrant report. Um, Ms. Spitzer, I don't know if you have any for the region. I do have some for the for Amherst. Are you, do you want to go first? I do. I need to, it'll take me just a moment to open each one. So if you have it, yours ready. Okay. Um, I'll let you go first. I will. Pull mine up. Um, okay, so um, I authorized by my signature on October 16th um, wages um, payroll for Amherst School, Amherst School District of $18,513.32. And as I mentioned, uh, oh, sorry, that was the payroll period ending October 7th that I signed on the 16th. I have four, so just so folks are prepared. <laughs> uh, 
um, I authorized by my signature to payables the amount of $170,371.25 for an warrant dated October 23rd, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $52,503.88, revolving fund expenses of $26,500, grant fund expenses of $2,638.73, FEMA fund um, of $20,722.89, COVID relief grant of $5,394, CARES, fund, CARES Act fund and the amount of $62,611.75. And I signed that on October 29th. I also authorized by my signature for the payroll period ending um, November 4. Um, the amount of $18,534.77. Um, and I signed that on October 30. And last, I authorize by my signature to payables in the amount of $639,129.94 for a warrant dated November 4th. Um, and that was Uh, actually, it's not, there's no detail as to where that um, was from. Uh, so that was signed uh, today. Ms. Spitzer? Yep. So um, I, auth I also have four. Uh, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $302,209.22 for a warrant dated October 21st, 2020, and this included general fund expenses of that amount, um, and I signed that on October 22nd, 2020. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $398,47 for the warrant dated October 23rd, 2020, and this included general fund expenditures of $177,140.92, revolving fund expenses of $32,846.33, and grant fund expense, expenses of $180,341.22. And I signed that on October 28th, 2020. Um, I, I approved here. I approved a transfer of funds um, from the district treasurer student activity master account to replenish funds um, expended from the principal student activity account. Um, and this was a transfer in the amount of $23,275.47. Um, and that was the date. I think it was October 29th, 2020. I approved that. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $622,625.16 for a warrant dated uh, October 4th, 2020. And this included general fund expenses of $621,136.24, revolving fund expenses of $1,257 and grant fund expenses of $231.92. And this was signed also on October 4th, 2020. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is gifts. And I don't believe we have any gifts in our packet tonight. Um, so we'll move on to the next. Um, if somebody from the region would like to make a motion. Mr. Sullivan. Wrong button. Before we do that, can we go back to future agenda planning? And so that I have a question about uh, the JLMC. Oh, I, we, would you like, should we put that on here? Well, I just felt that that was like a place where I could ask my question. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I I didn't realize that that email from Sasha today was asking me directly for agenda items because I, you know, we haven't heard anything back from you about what was going on with the other half of the um, discussion team. So I didn't know that we were going to do anything because I have one agenda item I would put on there, but I don't think everyone would like it. So I am waiting to hear from the rest of the committee what they would like to see us put on that agenda for when they do meet. That input from the re from the regional school committee. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Morris. I was going to say, would you want me to add that to the agenda for next Tuesday night? Yes. This is make it a posted item so that the committee could all have time to think about it and discuss it. Is that okay with you, Mr. Sullivan? It is because my agenda item would be pretty strong. So we'll we'll add it to Tuesday's meeting in preparation for the next JLMSC. Okay. Thank you. Oh, now I'll make I'll do that other thing. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, I make a, a suggestion that the regional school committee disband for the evening. <laughs> Motion to adjourn, Mr. Sullivan. There's, I'll second that. Roll call vote because there's no discussion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Kenny. Did you say aye? Yeah, McDonald, aye. Um, so the region is adjourned. And I'll move that we adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. And a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned.